Bridge River and uh, the Bridge River Valley. I'm, I'm, they call that in our language, land of plenty. Father and my dad said, watch, learn, remember, you know. The old timers would say, okay, we'll go up to Darcy, that's almost dry enough to burn. And then the old timers would get prepared and put the fire guard around, like the houses and stuff and then they'd burn up to the snow line. The snow line would be their fire guard. Eh? So, and uh, the brush in them days never got as thick as it did now, especially in the gullies like the maple and all those. Like some of those gullies now, as high as this building, you know, that's gonna be two, three thousand degrees heat, you burn that. It's because it, in them days it didn't, didn't grow that thick, you know, because uh, every 10 or 15 years they say, okay, it's starting to overgrow and then they'd burn it again. As time goes by and people aren't educated and versed in the benefits of fire and why we really need it and all that, that slowly got lost and the expertise got lost to do the prescribed burning. And so, yeah, you compound all that and it almost went away, right? So I know my whole career, I've been passionate about the use of prescribed fire and all the good reasons for it. When you hear the word ecosystem restoration, it's simply an objective and how to achieve it through prescribed fire. of weeds, all that napweed and daughterweed and by the roadsides and they're just clumps of almost like tissue paper just waiting for a match. Talking to the elders and gaining their knowledge and, and what they want to see and why they did things the way they were, that all forms that prescription part prior to the burn plant. A fire that's not prescribed right, it's going to wreck it instead of fix it. When the fire goes through and uh, you come back a couple of weeks later or something, then you see those little green stems coming up. You got to right properly. But if it burns down towards the roots, kills it, then you got to wait five, six years for that to grow. where the deer come down and uh, graze in the winter. And they weren't eating much food. So uh, Pop Olman must have got them uh, to go and start a fire below. and burnt the hillside. You can still see where that fire went just up so far. And the next spring that grass grew high and nice and green. So the deer had 
food through the winter casados. The grass grew over the snow. And that's what the deer ate in the winter. And that was a good burn. to be done on BC wildfires part two, right? Because for years, they've been trained to put fire out, right? Not, they, they haven't been taught how to apply fire to meet objectives. We're trying to prevent wildfire from coming into our reserve as well as uh, protecting the surrounding area. So if a fire does come through here, it's gonna stop at a certain point and just hit the ground level and put itself out at the bottom. It, it's actually an honor to be working on my own reserve to come back home and uh, do the work around here, letting uh, the elders look upon us and then being role models for the kids as well. The, the project that we're involved in right now, like um, uh, the community is getting more involved actually. They're more aware of the burns that we're doing now and it opens up people's eyes for that it should be done. and the management that has to be done for it because there's so much fuel loading now too nowadays and I'm glad that our band is actually one of the bands that like to burn and will burn on their on their land. Not too many bands do that nowadays actually. So we're trying to push forward forward so that with involving finesse that they it'll help bring other communities to realize what they can do.